talking about oral physiology today. Look at the tooth and the mouth and everything that goes on within it. So for the cells in the mouth, uh, the oral mucosa, that's mu um, mucus mucoid layer that covers the, the lips, cheeks, floor of your mouth, and ventral tongue. The, there is lining mucosa that's made up of epithelial cells. These are stratified squamous, non-keratinized epithelium on the surface of your lips, your cheeks, the floor of your mouth, and your ventral tongue. So when we say stratified squamous, non-keratinized, that means there's no keratin within it. Now remember, keratin makes up your hair and your nails, so there might be some roughness to it, right? So if you think of your lips, your cheeks, the floor of your mouth, and your ventral tongue, those epithelial cells are non-keratinized. They're smoother. Versus your masticatory mucosa, which also is uh, made up of epithelial cells, this is stratified squamous, keratinized, unless the animal is on more of a soft diet, then they're non-keratinized. But this is the epithelium on the surface that um, uh, surfaces that are subject to abrasion, so the roof of your mouth and gums. Specialized mucosa are epithelial cells, and again, they're non-keratinized, that incorporate nerve bundles or dendritic cells, and they're tightly bound to the lower layer of muscle on the sides and the surface of your tongue. So there are some differences in the cells that make up the oral mucosa of your mouth. It's probably important for you to understand why that is. In the cheek, there are buccal muscles, and they, these are a muscle sheet underlying the skin. It's used as the tunica muscularis, or the uh, muscular shirt, uh, put in another way. It's uh, this part of the digestive tract. Um, when you think about the hamster, they have a cheek pouch. It's getting food, and they can get the food out whenever they're ready to eat. Okay, So there are these uh, buccal muscles um, under the skin. In the tongue, skeletal muscles are arranged in three layers, and they're all at right angles to each other. So they're going to go um, upwards, downwards, and side to side uh, in uh, right angles to each other. Remember, your tongue is one of the strongest muscles of your body. Um, so in order to be strong and move in the way that you need to move it, in order to speak, it, the muscles are arranged in, uh, in different orders. There's the dorsal surface of your tongue, which is called the lingual papilla. So if we've talked about papilla in the past, or if this is the first time you've heard papilla, those usually may mean little um, fingers that stick up. There are four types of lingual papillae. Filiform papillae, which is mechanical. Fungiform papillae, which are sensory. Valate, or they're also called circumvallate papillae, and these papillae have little fingers up with deep moats around them. Uh, it's a core of connective tissue with nerve fibers that serve the taste buds, and these are sensory as well. And then there's foliate papillae, which are most easily seen in lagomorphs. And if you have to think about that for a minute, lagomorphs are rabbits. So these foliate papillae are sensory as well. So we have one mechanical papillae, and that's the filiform, and three sensory, fungiform, phthalate, and foliate. Here are some pictures of these um, papillae. So these are mechanical, and they're the filiform. They look like filaments. They're thinner. Here is a phthalate, and we have this connective tissue core with these uh, deep moats or valleys within uh, this uh, papillae, and the taste buds are on the side. Um, so here again is that papilla with the moat with the connective tissue core. Um, here's one with a taste bud on, on top of that connective tissue core. So we have fun, uh, fil filiform, fungi um, filiform, sorry, fungiform, um, so you can think of mushrooms, uh, valate and foliate. Taste is found in all vertebrates. Receptor cells in different sites may produce different sensations. So is it really a chemical reaction that leads to the taste? So sour, bitter, sweet, and salty, um, they all have small microvillus at its apex called a taste hair, which exits the epithelium through a taste pore. 
The taste hairs are the site of chemoreception, and it's the integration of the signals that takes place in the CNS that results in the perception of taste that are good or bad. And this is a learned behavior. So if you didn't eat a lot of broccoli when you were a kid, you probably think of or perceive the taste of broccoli as bad. It's just something that you have learned over time. Um, if you ate a lot of broccoli as a kid, you're going to associate that as a good taste, um, or at least not as bad as uh, a, a, a child that has never um, experienced it. And this is how animals learn how to uh, eat or avoid certain foods. The mucocutaneous junction is where the dry integument or skin turns to wet oral mucosa, and this exists at the anus, nostril, vulva, and urethra. Now there are different animals, different species, and they have different teeth. We're gonna talk about brachydont teeth. Brachydont teeth are teeth of omnivores or carnivores. The enamel is 95% inorganic material and is actually the hardest substance in your body. Dentin is softer than enamel, so the enamel has to cover the dentin in order to, be, uh, to protect the tooth. And then there is cementum, which has cementocytes with these cells, which creates a bone-like substance and it covers only the root of the tooth. So the, the root of the tooth is that uh, part of the tooth that is within the gum tissue and within the bone. The pulp cavity is in the center of the tooth and it has living cells within it. And so it has to have a blood supply. That blood supply is through connective tissue only. Um, it's the only tissue that can make blood vessels. So connective tissue makes blood vessels. Um, it comes up through the periodontal ligament, which also anchors the tooth. And that occurs down in the tip of the root of the tooth. This pulp cavity actually diminishes in size as the animal ages. So it continues to feed the tooth, make the tooth. But remember that this uh, enamel is inorganic material. It's not living material. So it does not need to be constantly supplied with um, blood. Uh, this dentin is also bone-like and um, it over time, it doesn't need as much uh, in the way of nutrition. Ameloblasts and odontoblasts. Uh, these blast cells are what make up or build uh, parts of the tooth. Ameloblasts make up enamel of the tooth. Enamel, ameloblasts. You can see that, that word within it. Whilst, um, and it happens while they're still unerupted in the gum. So before the, the tooth grows out of the gum, that's when the enamel is made. Once the tooth erupts, the ameloblasts die and that's why the enamel exists as a dead substance. Once it's lost, it cannot be remade. So if you destroy your enamel through lots of sugary drinks or tea or coffee, um, you can't get it back. Uh, so, you know, if, you, if you're concerned about your um, teeth uh, being uh, less white, it's, because, it's partly because you have lost enamel. Um, and it, the dentin, which is a yellow substance, is showing up beneath it. Odontoblasts make the dentin, and they lay it down in a matrix material, just like the bone, and then calcify it. They work from the outside of the tooth to the inside, and they remain active throughout life. But as I said, it continues to lay it down uh, from the outside of the tooth to the inside of the tooth. That's why we get a smaller pulp cavity in older animals. So here's a picture of ameloblasts in a uh, tooth that is continuing to form. It's under the gum uh, tissue. So here's pre here's predentin, here's pre-enamel, here's our ameloblasts. They're making the enamel. Um, so again, as it's pushing up, we have the forming tooth pulp. We have our odontoblasts. They're working really hard to provide uh, more dentin. Um, here's our predentin. It's going through the odontoblast. And for, um, I'm sorry, this is in the to tooth pulp. It's surrounding the tooth pulp. And this is our um, odontoblast making that predentin. And our ameloblasts are making that pre-enamel. Now, these ameloblasts, once they go through the surface of the gum tissue, they start to die off and you just have your enamel. In rodents, the enamel continues to grow beneath the gum line. 
It allows them to keep their incisors as sharp as a chisel if you provide them items to gnaw on. If they cannot gnaw, their teeth will continue to grow until they puncture the roof of their mouth. So you do want to be careful when you're dealing with animals who uh, continually erupt these uh, this tooth to make sure that they have something to chew on. Salivary glands, uh, they produce saliva to start the digestive process. Glands are made up of uh, clusters of cells called acini, and they secrete fluid. And this fluid is made of water, mucus, enzymes, and electrolytes. So hypersalivation can actually cause dehydration because we're losing this water and these electrolytes uh, through the saliva. The fluid from this acinous uh, flows into the ducts where the composition of the fluid is altered. Sodium is reabsorbed, potassium is secreted, and large quantities of bicarbonate ion are secreted as well. And the reason this is important is that it helps to buffer massive amounts of acid produced in the four stomachs of ruminants. So they salivate quite a bit um, as they're chewing the cud, um, as they're eating. Then as they chew their cud, which is material that has been eructated up out of the rumen, and then they swallow it back down, that uh, buffering happens within the, the uh, fore stomach uh, so that it um, creates an environment uh, that is a little safer for the animal. All right, so these salivary glands, um, we're going to find the parotid um, salivary gland. It's just below the ear, um, kind of outside the uh, mandibular glands, kind of on top of the mandibular, mandibular gland. There's also a sublingual gland um, and a zygomatic gland. We don't typically see that when we're doing our dissection. Um, so these three glands um, pr um, produce different types of secretions. The parotid gland has a serous watery secretion. Um, the submaxillary or mandibular gland has a mixed serous and mucus. Um, the sublingual is predominantly a mucus secretion. These are all stimulated by the autonomic nervous system, which controls both the volume and the type of saliva. So dogs on a dry diet will actually have more of a serous or watery secretion versus those on a meat diet. That's real. It's a, just a really interesting um, fact that uh, the saliva will change based on what the needs are within the mouth. Parasympathetic stimulation from the brain greatly enhances secretion and blood flow. And that's what's happening when you think of Pavlov's dogs. They would start to salivate when their digestive tract uh, was initiated by the smell of food or the thought of food. So he would ring a bell and present the animal with a steak. And the sal sal salivary glands would get ready to eat that steak um, through a parasympathetic stimulation within the brain. Now, over time, he could just ring the bell and get the automatic reaction of uh, salivating. And that's uh, how we found out that we can actually train a reaction to a sound uh, versus um, having to have that reward right in front of the animal. So function of saliva, they need it needs to be there. Uh, why? Because of lubrication and binding. We need to, we call this um, a uh, sm small chunk of food that you swallow, you chew it or masticate it, it becomes a small bolus. Um, and we need it slippery so it can go through the esophagus. So it binds it together, it lubricates it as it goes through the, esoph the esophagus. It coats, the saliva coats the oral cavity in the esophagus so food never touches the epithelium. And that's important because our epithelium is uh, very fragile. And so when we break it, uh, it needs to heal itself, and that just takes energy. Um, saliva also solubilizes dry food so that it can be tasted. Oral hygiene provides oral hygiene because it helps to flush out bacteria. It also contains a lysosome, which can lyse bacteria. Now, here's a thought for you. Why do you have dragon breath in the morning? Well, do you find that your um, mouth dries out quite a bit while you sleep? Well, you, your, your brain isn't stimulating it because you're not getting ready to eat. So your mouth dries out a little bit. So we haven't used that lysosome and we haven't flushed out that bacteria. Um, so the bacteria is sitting in, in your mouth. That's why it's really important to floss and, and brush your teeth before you go to bed. 
Um, saliva also initiates starch digestion through an alpha amylase that digests dietary starch into maltose, but it doesn't happen in carnivores or cattle. So that's just really interesting. Note, if we have an obligate carnivore like a cat or a snake or cattle, this starch digestion doesn't start until it goes through the, um, the, the rumen um, where the food is broken down into the duodenum where the pancreas releases amylase. There's also alkaline buffering, which is very important for rumens. Remember, um, they are burping up um, contents from their rumen, which is acidic. Uh, so they, we need to buffer that uh, rumen content or that um, uh, cud uh, in order for it not to damage the epithelium of the mouth. Also evaporative cooling, which is important for dogs because they don't have sweat glands throughout their body. So they cool by panting. So let me go back, I don't know why that jumped. Oral digestion. So what happens during uh, the process of, why do we call this the first part of digestion? So prehension means that we work on getting our food into our mouth. Our tongue and our cheeks work to get food. Um, easily seen when you are watching a dog in slow motion drinking or when you're watching a cow eat, they actually pull up clumps of grass with their tongue. Mastication is when the teeth working along with the saliva breaks the food up into smaller amounts so that we can swallow. Um, the tongue helps us with that and the esophagus and of course the saliva. See if this will play for us. Not sure if you'll be able to hear sound, but there is a closed captioning right here for you. Not that it'll help because it seems to be in Spanish or Portuguese. Oh. So prehension and mastication, and there's our bolus of an apple. And watch as the tongue lifts it up and pushes it back to the pharynx. Moving slowly down and should not go into the respiratory tract. That would be the wrong tube. But look, the glottis is closing because of the vocal folds and the epiglottis covering over top. There's also a reaction that will occur if the food happens to touch the glottis. Have you ever coughed something up because it, you felt like it was going down the wrong tube? That's that reaction. The esophagus pulls, push, pushes this bolus down, occasionally get bits caught up in the esophagus, and that will come down later uh, with more saliva. We have our lower esophageal sphincter into the stomach. More saliva bringing more bits of food down into the lower esophageal sphincter. We also call that the cardiac sphincter because it's near the heart. I'm going to stop this here, but you may continue to watch this. Um, I will post this link uh, online for you as well. Oral anatomy, looking at the teeth. Okay, what is this? This is a horse mouth. And what is this? This is a dog mouth, okay? So prehension is the ability to grab and hold food. Um, we have hard palate and soft palate back here. Certain anatomies, there's a little ulcer or cut on this tongue, which means we may have a sharp point back here. You can see these big teeth back here and they may have some sharp points just because of the wear of the teeth on, its, on it, each other. Here we have the hard palate uh, of the uh, dog, the soft palate back here, the lips, the teeth, and the tongue. Okay, so what does it look like? In cattle, there's a special thing called the dental pad. They don't have upper incisors. And they do have lower incisors, but there is a dental pad here that their lower incisors go against uh, as they um, chew food. 
you know, that that's one of the reasons they use their tongue to prehend food versus using their teeth, their incisors to chew or nip at the food at the grass um, like uh, horses will do. So here are the incisors of the horse. They can have canines um, on the lower uh, jaw, wolf teeth on the upper jaw. A lot of times these canines and wolf teeth are removed because they can uh, cause um, issues with the bit. And then we have our cheek teeth or molars, premolars and molars back here. Uh, this is a, so this is hypsodont to, teeth. We call that hypsodont, H-Y-P-S-O-D-O-N-T. And this is brachydont. So these are the teeth that you would see in a ferret, cat, or dog, um, omnor, omnivore or carnivore teeth. Um, they have sharp teeth up front, the incisors and the canines, and we gradually get um, to the back, we get grinding teeth. So these are ripping, tearing teeth and grinding teeth in the back. Um, you will see this more particularly, the grinding teeth with animals that are omnivores. Uh, and you will see with a cat, they are um, obligate carnivores. They do have premolars and molars, but they are much sharper than you see in a dog. We call This is the median line of the tooth, and this is the lingual surface. So it's that which is could be touching the tongue. We have the labial surface, which is that which touches the lips, the buccal or buccal surface, which touches the cheeks. Um, and we call anything that is moving toward the front of the mouth mesial or toward the median line mesial. And anything that's going away from the medial line, we call that distal. All right, so the tooth. We talked about the enamel, how it's made. Do you remember the, the cells that make the enamel? It's the ameloblasts. The uh, enamel is the hardest substance in the body. With brachydont teeth, the enamel covers only the crown. In hypsodont teeth, which are the teeth of animals uh, like um, hamsters, lagomorphs, like rabbits, um, cows and horses. Uh, this hypsodont teeth, the enamel develops, the, envelops the crown and the body, but not the root. So it, they do have enamel on their teeth, um, but it, it covers uh, more than in brachydont teeth. It has to be very sharp um, and very tough because they're constantly grinding it down. Dentin is that hard substance that's similar to bone. Do you remember what it's made by? Odontoblasts. Um, it forms the bulk of the tooth and surrounds the pulp cavity and makes up the main component of the tooth. And here I ask a question, what does hypsodont versus brachydont mean? Um, brachydont means short tooth. Um, it is only a tooth that it, once you lose your baby tooth, you get your adult tooth, that's your last chance. With hypsodont teeth, they have baby teeth and then they get their adult teeth, which constantly erupt um, for, the, for the life of the pet. Now, if the pet lives long enough, eventually they will lose those teeth because eventually it stops erupting out. There's only a, so much of the tooth that is available. So different parts of the tooth, the enamel, the dentin, the pulp cavity. This here is called the gingival sulcus, and this will become important later. It is the valley that exists between the gum line or gingiva and the tooth itself. Now, it covers the bone uh, that surrounds the tooth. And this bone that surrounds the tooth is called alveolar bone. Alveolar bone uh, contains that socket in which the tooth rests. Now the, it's, the tooth is held there by something called cementum um, and also a periodontal ligament, which also surrounds the lower portion of the tooth. Now, through this central canal we have in the periodontal ligament, we have um, this pulp cavity is open to blood vessels and nerves. There may also be a lateral canal uh, that uh, has vessels and nerves moving through it. So cementum is that thin bone-like connective tissue covering. With brachydont, the cementum covers only the root of the tooth, and remember enamel covers only the crown. With a hypsodont tooth, the cementum covers the entire root superficial to the enamel. So it's underneath 
the enamel up here at the neck and down at the, crown, at the uh, root. The pulp cavity is the central space of the tooth containing the pulp and must have a blood supply. Without a blood supply, this tooth will die. The pulp is that soft tissue filling the pulp cavity and it includes sensory nerves, arteries, veins, lymphatics, and primitive connective tissue. The periodontal ligament is a connective tissue structure attaching the cementum to the alveolar bone, which contains collagen fibers and is arranged in bundles. Then we have the gingiva or gum tissue. Marginal gingiva is unattached and it surrounds the coronal or crown aspect of the tooth itself. It, it um, does not cover the alveolar bone there. The gingival sulcus is the area between the marginal gingiva and the tooth surface. Now we measure the depth of that surface, sur I'm sorry, surface to tell us if there's any problem with the way this tooth is uh, within the socket. If we have any infection within this socket, we'll get loss of bone. And so we'll get a deeper valley here and we wanna measure that valley with a special probe in order to tell us what that, what that uh, depth is. The normal gingival sulcus depth is one to three millimeters in the dog and zero to one millimeters in the cat. So it should be very, very short in the cat, somewhat longer in the dog. And it's important that we measure every tooth every time we do a dental cleaning so we can check to make sure that there's no sign of, um, of bone loss uh, that indicates periodontal disease. Our incisors are used for um, grasping food and starting to tear food. Um, and I apologize that these um, pictures are covering up some, some of the words, but incisors are referred to large eye or small eye, depending on if they're an adult or a baby tooth. So if it's an adult tooth, we refer to it as big eye and as a baby tooth, small eye. Canines see uh, either big or small, and they're used as piercing or tearing food. Cheek teeth are grinders. They are premolars, which are the rostral cheek teeth, the ones in front, and molars, which are the caudal cheek teeth. So you should know the names for all of these types of teeth. We're also going to give you numbers to memorize as well. So some more helpful hints on how we uh, describe teeth and lesions within the mouth. Uh, we need descriptive terms. So mesial means close or close to the midline. Distal means away. Buccal or buccal means cheek. Lingual means uh, tongue. And palatal means um, the palate. Incisal is the biting surface of the rostral teeth. And occlusal is the chewing surface of the caudal teeth. So lots of terms to understand. Now we refer to uh, dental formulas when we're talking about uh, different species. There are formulas for deciduous teeth, which are baby teeth that fall out, and there are formulas for permanent teeth. For dogs, they have 28 baby teeth. They have three incisors up and down or on each side. I'm sorry, up and down on each side. They have um, uh, canines, um, upper and lower canines, um, both right and left, they have uh, premolars, three premolars, but no molars. They don't get molars until they're a little older. And the, so they have um, uh, 42, not quite double, um, the amount of adult teeth. So we have three incisors, right and left, upper and lower, um, two, four canines, so uh, right and left, upper and lower. Um, we have four premolars on the right side, upper, four premolars on the left side, upper, four premolars on the right or um, lower right and left sides as well. On the molars, we have two, dogs have two molars upper on the right and left side and three molars on the lower jaw, right and left side. So that's how you read it. So the first number is the upper and the Second number is the lower. And then we always have to remember that we have two sides, so left and right. For cats, they have 26 deciduous teeth. Um, they're missing a couple of premolars that we would see in dogs. Um, and they have 
30 permanent teeth. Um, they're missing a couple of premolars and a couple of molars that we normally see in dogs. For ruminants, they have 20 baby teeth and 32 permanent teeth. For horse, they have 24 baby teeth and between 36 and 42. So what we're looking at is what, what's the difference between 36 and 42? They may or may not have canines. Um, so that's why you see a zero there. Rats and mice have uh, 16 teeth and a rabbit has 28 teeth. And these are some pictures of some severe uh, malocclusions, um, malincisions, I guess would be the correct term for these incisors. Uh, these teeth are constantly growing. And if they don't come in contact normally with the lower teeth, where they're not given the opportunity to chew on things, they will grow all the way back into their jaw or into their skin. And so it's really important that we keep an eye on this and make sure we're trimming them if need be. All right, there's another system of um, identifying uh, teeth. Um, it uses three numbers, okay? The first number identifies the quadrant, um, and there are only four quadrants of the mouth. So there's right side upper, left side, or left side upper, left side lower, and right side lower. The second and third numbers actually identify the tooth, and that's always represented by two numbers. So if we are counting, if you look at, um, look at yourself in the mirror, and you point to your right upper mouth, point to your right upper mouth and your teeth, that's number one. Go to the left upper, that's two. Go to the uh, left lower, that's three. And left and right lower is four. It goes in a circle. And this is actually incorrect. It goes right, left. Oh, I'm sorry, it is, it is correct. Right, left, left, right. Right, left, left, right. Okay, so upper right, Upper left, lower left, lower right. One, two, three, four. And my suggestion is you do this a number of times until you can remember it starts upper right. One, go around in a uh, counterclockwise manner. One, two, three, four. Okay, so the numbering uh, starts in the front of the mouth and it starts with 01. So 201 would be the left upper um, quadrant and the first incisor. 101 is the right upper quadrant and the first incisor. 401 is the right lower quadrant and the fourth in, or first incisor. 301 is the left lower quadrant and is the first incisor. Sometimes animals of different species seem to be missing certain teeth. So if a horse does not have a canine, we still count that canine as possibly being there. So what we can do is remember that it always starts with the incisors and the canines always are 04 and the first molars are always 09. So uh, it's important to remember that the uh, we typically have three incisors, unless we're talking about lagomorphs or uh, hamsters, guinea pigs. Um, the canine will always be called 04 if they have one, 204, 104, 304, 404. Um, and the molar, the first molar will be always an 09. So how this uh, is read is the central incisor is identified as tooth one, the intermediate incisor is 02, the lateral or corner, corner incisor is 03, and the canine is 04. The free, first premolar is 05, and the first molar is 09. So this is the rule of four or nine. So if any species has fewer teeth, like a cat or a, a cow, then the rule of four and nine is developed. The rule states that the canine tooth is always designated by 04 and the first molar by 09. Teeth are counted from 0, 01 to 0, 05. The first molar is counted as 09, and then the count goes backwards with the fourth premolar.
being 08 and the third premolar being 07, as it is in the dog. This convention allows identical teeth to have identical numbers in different species and decreases confusion. I'm sure at this point you're saying this does not decrease my confusion, but when we're in class, let's count it together. Remind me to do that um, and we'll make it much more clear. Here it is uh, laid out as a chart. This is a chart you should be filling out for each patient when you do a dental cleaning. Um, if we're noticing lesions or deep sulcuses on any of these teeth or one of these teeth is missing or you have to remove a tooth, then this needs to be um, filled out appropriately. The nice thing about this chart is it has both the triaden numbering system and the other numbering system, which is I1, I2, I3, C1, P1, P2, P3, P4, et cetera. In the dog, the incisors canines in the first premolar and the mandibular third molar have one root each. Why is that important? Why would I want you to remember how many roots a tooth has? Well, it's important to know this if we're needing to remove a tooth. If we don't remove all of the roots, we can have a, a foreign body with no blood supply that may result in an abscess. And so we want to make sure we're removing all the roots. So for one root only, incisors, canines, and the first premolar. This is the first premolar. Cats don't have a first premolar, so you often won't see that. Um, although not every cat reads the book or listens to the lecture, so there are, there are individual variations. The maxillary second and third premolar, the mandibular second and third and fourth premolars, and the mandibular first and second molars have two roots. So we're talking about when we talk about maxillary versus mandibular, upper versus lower. So upper second and third premolars and the lower second, third, and fourth premolars, the mandibular first and second molars, lower first and second molars have two roots. The maxillary fourth premolar, which is this big sucker right here, the first molar and the second molar on the top all have three roots. So one key to remembering the number of roots is to recall that the mandible does not have any three rooted teeth. Um, and that's a pretty easy one to remember. In the cat, again, the incisors, the canines, and the maxillary second premolar, remember they don't have a first premolar, so they have the second premolar. They all have one root each. The maxillary third premolars, the mandibular third and fourth premolars, and the mandibular first molar have two roots. The maxillary fourth premolar has three roots. The number of roots in the maxillary first molar varies from one to three roots, and they're usually fused together. So the only one with three true roots will be that fourth upper premolar in the cat. So dogs and cats, a normal occlusion means they will have a scissor bite, which means their upper and lower teeth should come uh, together just slightly off. So if you look at, a, at scissors, those blades go past each other just a little bit. And that's called a scissor bite. An abnormal occlusion, we're going to name a couple of them. A mandibular brachynathism, think about the words. Brachy means short, nathism means chewing, uh, so mandibular. So if it's mandibular, that means the mandible is shorter than the maxilla. How does that look? If you take your mouth and put it so that your chin is inside your upper teeth, how does that look? That looks like they have an overbite. With a mandibular prognathism, that means the mandible is longer than the in, uh, incisors. So what does that look like? Uh, can you put your mouth in that um, formation? That's actually normal in a lot of brachycephalic breeds. We see it in bulldogs, right? Um, and it's when they have an underbite. Their upper uh, layer of teeth is behind their lower layer of teeth. There are also things called crossbites, which is where the um, bite goes um, in different directions, left and right. And then there's rye bite, where you have kind of a wavy mouth. 
horses um, are slightly different. Um, they should have scissor mouths. So when looking at it, an oblique angle, to, um, uh, you might see an ob uh, oblique angle due to the incisors being uneven, uh, having an uneven mouth. Sow mouth is what we call an elongated mandible. So it's also called a mandibular pronathism. Parrot mouth would be when we have a shortened mandible, which is also called uh, mandibular brachynathism. Step mouth is an uneven wear of one or more teeth on the occlusal plane of the cheek teeth. So we have an uneven um, wear on one of, the, one of the teeth and it looks like there's a step uh, occurring within the teeth. Innervation of the tongue. How do we get um, our tongue to move the way it needs to? Um, or to taste what it needs, or to feel what it needs to. So taste, which is a special sense, sensation, which is pain, temperature, and tactile, tactile, and then motor innervation. And this comes through the uh, hypoglossal nerve, which is a cranial nerve. Cranial nerves um, are nerves that come directly out of the brain, and uh, they are numbered, one through 12. Uh, number seven is the facial nerve. It has both sensory and motor, function. Um, it does face and scalp movement, salivation, tears, and taste. Number nine is the glossopharyngeal nerve. It does both sensory and motor, and its function is tongue movement, swallowing, salivation, and taste. Number 12 is the hypoglossal nerve. It's a motor nerve, and it has uh, the function of tongue movement. Number five is the trigeminal nerve, and that has both sensory and motor function. Um, sensations from the head and teeth and chewing. And 10 is our famous vagus nerve. We also call that the wanderer. It has both sensory and motor function and it innervates the muscles to the pharynx and larynx and controls swallowing and vocalizing. 10 is a, is a big one to remember. Um, these are Ro Roman numerals. I've had people ask what those are before. Um, if you haven't um, come across Roman numerals when you're in high school, please let me know so we can kind of go over that. Um, but remember that five is um, written as a V and these I's are each one. So we have five, one, one, that will be seven. X means 10, so an I before the 10 means nine. So that's just basics on uh, Roman numerals. All right, the skull, the facial portion is what we're talking about. And within the oral region, we talk about the incisive, maxillary, and palatine bones, and the mandible, which surrounds um, the, the, and all of these surround the ca uh, oral cavity. The incisive bone is the rostral bone, bone, and obviously it holds the incisors. The palatine bone forms the hard palate. So if you put your tongue on the roof of your mouth, you're touching your palatine bone. It, it forms that with the maxillary and incisive bones. The maxillary bone is the lateral part of the face and the part of the hard palate that holds the upper cheek teeth. All right, there's a term that is called floating. Floating refers to the filing off of sharp edges or points of the horse's cheek teeth inside of the bottom arcade and the outside of the upper arcade. So the way those teeth come together, they form a, um, a point, uh, and when you're looking at the bottom uh, of the, his mouth, the, the jaw portion of his mouth, the, the points will be on the inside. And if you look at the top part of his mouth, the points will be on the outside. And it's just how those teeth come together. And if um, they have um, an uneven wear, that causes kind of a shearing of that enamel. Periodontal disease is the most common disease of the dog and the cat, and it requires that we do a dental prophylaxis to prevent it. Prophylaxis means prevention. In order to prevent periodontal disease, we have to be proactive. Sometimes we have to give preventive antibiotics or prophylactic antibiotics. If we already have periodontal disease, that means we have a lot of bacteria in the mouth. We may already have abscesses or something going on in the mouth. And we want to give these antibiotics preoperatively for a couple of days before um, the, uh, the, the dental cleaning and continue it after. If you've ever had your wisdom teeth out, you know that you had to take antibiotics prior to the procedure 
and then after as well, just to help control the bacteria. Daily brushing is the only thing that has been proven to be helpful in keeping down plaque and tartar on the mouth, on the teeth. Uh, using a hard abrasive diet can help, and then having routine oral exams by the veterinarian. Dental Profi, I won't go over the technique very much. Um, just know that the dental instruments are held in a modified pencil grip, so not exactly how you would hold a pencil, but pretty close. And you are using your um, other fingers that are not holding it to balance and, and steady your hand on the animal. Um, this dental instrument has a working end, which is this end here. It has a shank that, that attaches the working end to the handle. This is an extractor, and it's helped to loosen and remove the major portion of a supra gingival calculus. So if the, if the animal has a lot of calculus or tartar on their teeth, we can actually crack that tartar off with this extractor. We also use this extractor for extracting teeth. This is that periodontal probe that I talked about when you want to measure gingival sulcus depth. So take a minute and remember how deep do we want uh, to find uh, a gingival sulcus in a cat? Zero to one millimeters. And in a dog, one to three millimeters. So uh, good job if you remembered that. So here's the millimeter. This is one millimeter, should be no deeper than that on a cat. This is three millimeters, should be no deeper than that on a dog. If we find that we have a spot that is deeper, we may have a problem. This is an explorer. It has a pointy tip. It's used to determine defects of the tooth surface. It looks like a shepherd's hook. It can be used both sub and super gingivally, which means you can use it under the gum line. Um, I am going to end the show here so I can just go to that slide and move that picture, make sure we're giving you all the information. So dental prophylaxis, this explorer, um, we're, we can go below the gum line, the calculus uh, that is growing on the tooth and it grows, calculus is formed after plaque. Plaque is just a film that covers the tooth. Once that film covers that tooth, then it can start to harden. That's what we call calculus. Um, it can interfere with the ability to perceive any defects in the crown, so we got to get the calculus off. And then we inspect the tooth for any missed plaque and calculus by uh, application of a disclosing solution or by air drying, which will make those deposits appear chalky white. And then we can also just scrape along the surface of the tooth and make sure it seems to be smooth. We use ultrasonic scalers when we're doing dental prophies. That ultrasonic vibration of the metal tip and water remove a lot of that super gingival plaque, tartar, necrotic tissue, and debris. Each tip will have its own frequency. And we just use a fine mist of water. If we use it without water, it becomes very, very hot and will overheat and cause damage to the tooth surface. It's important to remember that water mist can aerosolize bl bacteria, blood, and debris, anything that's in the mouth, up to four feet from the walk work area. And so you always want to wear gloves, goggles, and a mask. Um, it's like getting sneezed on continuously while you're doing a dental. So think of that and make sure you're wearing your proper um, protective um, equipment. You should spend no more than 15 seconds on each tooth. It's important to remember that because it gets very hot, even with the water, if you are on that tooth surface for more than 15 seconds, you can do damage. This is a polisher. A polisher is important because we're, as we're scaling the teeth, we're making tiny grooves in the teeth. So polishing with an electric or air-powered polisher removes any plaque that may, may have been missed and smooths the tooth surface. Because it also generates considerable heat, we want to use a lot of profi paste and use for a brief period of time on each tooth. So it's going to remove etching, it can remove some of the staining, and it removes microscopic material. It's really important that we do a polishing after we do a scaling because bacteria like to live in those little tiny grooves and plaque and uh, cal calculus will come back a lot sooner if we don't polish. 
when you go to the dentist, they simply hand scale your teeth. So these are hand scalers. They have three sharp sides and a sharp tip. We do not want to go underneath the gingival surface because we can cut it and cause some damage. Uh, they are particularly useful when we're removing calculus from a narrow but deep fissure. Um, we do find these fissures on the cheek side surface of the fourth premolar and sometimes also on the um, canine of the cat. Scalers are just used for super gingival scaling because they can damage anything below that. So we don't want to use it subgingivally. Curet. Curettes have two sharp sides and a rounded toe. They can go underneath the uh, gingiva because they, they're rounded on the end. They don't cause a lot of problems. They're designed so that each end is a mirror image of the opposite end so that you can turn it around and use it appropriately on the opposite side. So um, if one end doesn't appear to be adapting to the curvature of the tooth, you just turn it around. Here's how we brush teeth. And I have another um, uh, video that will show you how to do it properly. I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, use that video, uh, put that link directly on your eLearn account so that you can see that and watch it yourself. Now again, bring any questions that you have about oral anatomy and physiology in the class and we'll talk about it.